All right, let's do this. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming, and thank you for inviting me, uh, Kevin, Carl, Stephanie. Thank you, Margaret, for having me out here to do this crazy thing. Um, yes, I'm Aria Harvey, and I'm here to represent Tale of Tales, um, which is myself and my partner in this life of crime, Michael Samin. We are a video game studio based in Ghent, Belgium. Um, as you can see here, I've given myself this lofty title of data director, um, because when people ask me, what do you do within Tale of Tales, I'm always sitting there like, um, well, everything. I mean, you know what it's like being an indie developer. I make the models, the 3D models. I sometimes animate the 3D models. I put them in the game engine. I determine what you're supposed to do with the, the objects that are interacted with. I design the game also. I mean, I also prefer then the title of real-time artist and um, that's something that means a lot to me actually as a pair of words but um, really it all comes down to this I'm going through airport customs um, when I was in the, going to the indicate in LA in October and um, you know here they have these nice electronic passport scanners and stuff when you're coming in from an international flight and um, but in Los Angeles, it was the old-fashioned go up to the booth, and there's the clerk standing there, and he asks, looks you in the eye and asks you, so, is this business or pleasure? And, you, and I said, well, it's business. And then the next question they always ask you is, so, what do you do? And this time, for the first time ever, I looked the guy in the eye, and I said, I make video games. And he was just looked, I mean, usually I come up with this thing, oh, I'm a designer, I like work with computers, because, but he just, he, a big smile broke out across his face, and he says, I think you're my favorite person who's come through here all day. <laughs> and he wanted to talk about games, and I was just standing there like, I just came in on a 10 hour flight. Anyway, <laughs> so, um, anyway, I don't call myself, it's just funny, because, so I titled this talk, Let's Make a Video Game. And you may be wondering why I called it such a thing. It's not that I want to make a video game with you or before your very eyes, although that would be kind of cool. I can't swing it. Um, um, and I'm not being intentionally opaque or oblique or anything. This is a quote. It's in quotes. And um, it's a quote that I remembered in that moment when I said, hey, I'm, my name is Aria Harvey. I make video games. Because this is the thing the day that Michael and I, we, I looked, we were playing some PlayStation game. And it suddenly dawned on us almost at the same moment, hey, this is interactive, this is art. And I looked at him and I said, let's make a video game. <laughs> How hard could it be? <laughs> let's make a PlayStation game, we'll put it on a disc, you know? Um, so this is a quote, let's make a video game. Video games, man. <laughs> so, um, but you, I think that a lot of people don't understand fully what, you know, what Carl was talking about, like sort of where, Michael and I came from, so I'm going to do a little brief, uh, very brief sort of overview, just so you, because we, we've said a lot of things in the past 10 years, and it, it all comes from someplace. We're not crazy, you know. Um, I live in Belgium, but I am American. I lived in New York City for 10 years. I went to school at Parsons School of Design, where I studied sculpture. Art is my, yeah, Parsons, no, uh, art is my first and biggest love, but parallel to that, um, there's always been computers. <laughs> My whole adult life, I have worked with computers to create artwork. Um, and it's like when I was in, I didn't grow up playing games as such, right? Um, but I did, there were always computers. My mom, when I was eight, she, bless her, she enrolled me in a computer camp because I don't know, she thought computers are the future. And so um, she even rolled me in computer camp, but I, I really loved it. It was like um, th some class and they taught me how to program basic and I did what any eight year old would do with basic. I have printed the blue background with the red hearts printing across the screen ad nauseum. I just, that's a favorite toy, you know? And then at a certain point I became a teenage girl in the 80s and I wanted nothing to do with any of it anymore at all. I gave away my Commodore or whatever it was to my nephew and I just swore like oh, I don't want to use computers ever again, you know, because it was a boy thing. You know, it's like because and I games were around and me and my sister may have played a few video games or something, but it really wasn't that important. It wasn't until the 90s when I went to Parsons and they had a computer lab. 
And so I'm, I'm 18, 19 years old, and they have this computer lab at Parsons that was starting up. And a friend of mine told me, oh, this is the best work-study job you're ever going to get. This is the best one in the whole school. Because the more you learn, the more they pay you. <laughs> I shit you not. So it was like, so I was sitting there like, <laughs> I already know a bit about computers. You know, it was like DOS and like, you know, there were some 3D programs, but you had to like literally program that stuff, you know. Anyway, I digress. Um, the point being that um, I got back into computers at that point in the 90s. Now, I graduated from school, and then suddenly in 1994, there was this thing, the World Wide Web. So the very first serious artworks I made were for web browsers. Um, this is a familiar site to some of you, obviously. This was the creme de la creme. This is the browser of the heroic early period of the internet. Um, from 1994, I was a web designer in net art, and that means I made web pages that were not for information, but, but were art for artworks into themselves. It's kind of a foreign concept today. This is a nice picture of Michael and I in the year 2000, looking like babies. Um, now, Michael and I met in 1999, um, and we've, we've been working together ever since. I'll explain that in a minute, but just want to point out that this is a diagram of Michael's mind. It's like the heavenly spheres, you know, God in his heaven and the hell in the middle, um, the devil in the center. Well, I mean, I was a little worried when they asked me to come and give a keynote because my mind is a bit more like that. <laughs> um, so I, I don't think I can really fully express enough about our games in a linear fashion. Um, so this whole talk is kind of taking this uh, format of a very nonlinear um, sort of tour of um, ways that of thinking about games, or I that I think about games, I suppose. But in this picture, it's still 2000, and I'm there looking all like innocent and everything because it's two years until video games. <laughs> That's right. I look at this picture with nostalgia. If you had asked me in 1999 who I was and what I did or who I thought I was, whatever, I might have, I probably would have, de definitely would have described it like this. Hi, I'm Aria. Um, I have a website and it's called entropy8.com. Um, and I have met my true love and his name is Michael and he has a website called zooper.com and we're both web designers. Um, we came together and we made a website together, a, coll uh, a collaboration together called entropy8zooper.org. It's mathematics, folks. And the very first thing that Michael and I collaborated on was this site called Skin on Skin on Skin. It actually um, was a series of love letters between us. Um, at first it was private and then it was made public. Um, we, Michael and I met online, I should say this. Um, we were both in an internet collective called hell.com, so that was the name of the server, hell.com. And um, we met in an online video chat, as one does. Um, and <laughs> the, day after, the day after we met um, in this video chat, where there were a lot of other people, but we sort of got our own room. Um, the day after, he sent me this um, web page. And it's, it was interactive, it's an HTML page, but it's like, it mirrored your cursor. Um, so when you moved your cursor, the other cursor moved in a mirror fashion, and when you moved in, it the chest in the center breathed in and moved out and it breathed out. And um, he sent me this, and um, th that unbidden, even he didn't even ask or desire this, but the next day um, I sent him back a web page also, and that ha is how our collaboration started. Um, I, it, I sent him a web page which was a cloud of lines floating around with words from our uh, chat the night before. And since it was, yeah, okay, I'll admit it, it was a sex chat. Um, <laughs> I, it seductively, as you moved the mouse up and down, revealed bits of my body which I had laid on a scanner. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so then, but it, it went on for like a very long time between us um, as we talked. Um, we, we still had this habit of sending these pages back and forth to each other, looking for a way um, to sort of uh, talk to each other that in a way that didn't involve words. We were in different countries. I was in New York City, he was in um, Belgium. And so things like him tracing, a, doing a tracing of his hand and sending me that JPEG, and then I would do a trace, I did a tracing of my hand, put it on top and sent it back to him. Um, we didn't know if we would ever meet each other in person. So we tried to come up with ways that we could touch one another, in a sense, um, through the screen. Um, 
it's it when we came up with every page was interactive and in some way um, we were trying to reveal a part of our own I don't know inner selves to each other it was cyberspace this is one of my favorite lost concepts of the internet it's um, it's a lost concept now but it's where I come from and it had a strong formative influence on what I make and how I make it and how I even think about video games um, our friend Olia Lianya, Lialina came up with a way, uh, put a word to this or a phrase to this, and the phrase was location equals yes. When you have a web browser in the bar where you put the URL, that's called the location bar. And back then, it was very important where you put things. So, like the fact that we met on hell.com was significant. If, if we put a, 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 made a folder and put some files in it, that often had some sort of um, metaphorical significance. It's why entropy8.com plus zuper.com equals entropy8zuper.org. Mathematics. Location equals yes. Yeah. So that period, but it turned out that period of us being apart didn't last very long. We got together. So by 2000, that uh, picture, we were together in Belgium, but um, and we were still feeling the blissful effects of our time in cyberspace. This is a project that we made together, um, which marks the first time that we made a 3D world, um, or really made any sort of like really um, dedicated full-on 3D project. Um, um, this was a commission called Eden.Garden. It was commissioned by uh, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art for a show that they were going to have in 2001. Um, that was sort of a celebration, believe it or not, a celebration of digital media art. Um, this is some, it was an online-only exhibition, which is the only reason we wanted to be in it. Um, and it's um, kind of like what it did was, <laughs> I'll just try and explain it briefly, but what it did was that you would, we made a parallel web browser. It's like a browser within a browser. You would type in a URL into the, our new location field, and it would go and get, fetch that web page. It would parse all the text, and it would find the HTML tags. So, and then it would turn those tags into elements in a garden, a virtual garden of Eden. So the idea was every single web page has within it a paradise. Um, so, for example, an embed tag becomes a big elephant. Uh, a layer tag or a div tag becomes a little silver robot. All the align tags are flowers, um, you know, and so on. You get if you had the blink tag, you got the big volcano, and that was great. <laughs> that was great. Um, so yeah, it went like that, and and and, and, and so each individual web page created this this thing, and you could see the page streaming in. You could see all the like um, letters being coming in on the, in real time, pretty much. And we were there as Adam and Eve in this garden, and um, as you played, we would do a little dance. Um, or as the, 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 it was interactive in the sense that you could go through the world, but we were, you couldn't interact with us, we were just running through the garden. Um, it's basically, I, one of us was controlled with one side of the keyboard, the other side of the key, letters of the keyboard was the other one of us, and as the letters came in, it would make us, each letter would trigger an emotion, and those motions were even, um, were, were sort of parodies of uh, traditional uh, first-person shooter actions like run, jump, die, shoot, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and after a while, if you clicked around, you could, you could change the camera view and, and find out that you, the first-person view you had all the time revealed that you were actually the snake in the Garden of Eden. All right, I have a little video of this. Um, it's really bad sound. It's like the only video that I have of it, um, but I'll show it to you just to, so you get an idea of how it kind of blurred into the middle. So, yeah, the, the rabbits are font tags, and depending on the size of the font on the page, you can get a different size rabbit. And, um, yeah, the buildings, I can't remember what the building, you could go inside the buildings, and sometimes that would take you to another world, like a desert. Thank <laughs> you. 
yeah, that was that. <laughs> but at a certain point, Tale of Tales began, yeah? We, would, we decided we were into this whole game thing. We were like, we should make a video game. We've been around 10 years now. I mean, um, we recently had our 10th anniversary in December, and we celebrated by releasing these, um, a packet of a uh, bundle of experiments and prototypes. And there were things that we've made over the 10 years to test concepts, try things out. Sometimes lead, these things led to a finished game, but often they didn't. Um, if you missed out on the when we had this on our site, you can email me and um, after this is over, and I'll tell you how you can get it because we want people to have it. Um, and they're just crazy things, um, but maybe you can appreciate playing with crazy things. Um, so this talk was originally called "The Next Ten Years of Tale of Tales," and I've sort of been reflecting on. I mean, they they told me to repackage it, and rewrite it as a keynote, and I came up with this idea of, about talking about games and figuring out what I should say. And I mean, when we started making video games to us, it was the reason why we said, let's make a video game was because we were looking at it. And to us, it was just photons of light and interaction, you know? We didn't have any preconceived ideas about what a game was. We just immediately started modding stuff. We were like, okay, Quake, mod. Let's put Adam and Eve in Quake. You know, why not, you know? It was great. Um, so, but at the same time, um, we, 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 the thing I have to make clear is that we didn't draw this, we had in our minds this idea that we weren't making games in the first place. I mean, there was this distinction for us, this line between games which are ancient. There's always been games, you play games your whole life from birth practically, and then there's video games the pixels and the interaction and the thing that you do in your living room or whatever, you know, that was to us a completely different subject. Um, and, to, and to us, there was no limit in that. Um, there was no rules in that. We started going around to games conferences and figuring out how people make games because we were completely fucking clueless and perplexed why games were the way they were. We play, started playing lots and lots of games at that point and realizing that, that, that why they were genre bound, why there were no, not many women playing games, all these things which were questions for us did not have answers or rather people didn't have answers for it. We just went to these conferences, we'd write these reports for the people who helped nice people um, at the university in Maastricht, um, in the Netherlands, who had um, allowed us to, helped us pay to go there. and. And it was just always kind of a mess. I mean, for us um, trying to figure out why there were all these limits to what video games could be. We, we had to learn how to make games and we didn't have a lifetime to learn C++. So we felt like, okay, let's find a way to just make something for real, like no mods, you know? So we found this tool called Quest 3D. Um, which was actually, um, is, I don't know if it's still around, it was actually meant for art architectural visualization. And the, the guys who make it there in, in Holland, and they were like, don't make games with it, and we did it anyway. Cause, <laughs> um, but the reason we loved it was because, you know, this is sort of a split view, but this is pretty much it. You'd have two viewports, and one is the program view, it's visual programming, so you're connecting up blocks of, um, of data, however, you know, you're making your game there, yeah? And then at the bottom, you have your viewport, which is your view into your world the game world that you're making, and it was amazing, because it was real time, it's on all the time, no compiling, it's just on. So you're, everything you do in the game world, you're seeing that happening. You know, it's like when you're hooking up AI on your model that you've animated, you're seeing her run around as you like program other behaviors, you're changing the color of the sky, you're raising and lowering the ground, you're, you know, all your glitches are real time glitches, and they're beautiful. And so, this was my first conception of what it meant to be a real-time artist. This to me was like, oh, this is, a, this is something else even. If video games are something else, this is something else on top of that. It's a new way to be an artist, you know? So let's make a video game, real-time art. To us, there were only, this is the only thing in our minds when we started in 2002, 2003. There is only one time, and that time is now. <laughs> there is only one place. <laughs> Location equals yes. <laughs> and that's, that was the beginning of us. So I, I wanted to make this talk and it's like to reflect in a way upon what I've learned and what I've seen. Um, 
and, um, and things. Um, but over the years, we've thought a lot about you. Um, you as a player, you as colleagues and fellow game developers, you as physical human beings with lives and bodies. Um, and I, I couldn't just, I even wanted to talk about a lot of your games, but it was like, I suddenly felt like unqualified. It was like, there's so many different ways to be an independent developer and there's so many different ways that games are being made nowadays. Um, so I, th I was thinking about it, okay? It's like an incantation is a charm or spell created using words. An incantation may take place during a ritual, either a hymn or a prayer, and may invoke a praise or praise a deity. Yeah, okay, that's the definition according to the internet. I'm not saying that this place is holy or that video games must be worshipped, but maybe the creative spirit within us as indie developers should be. We can get praise for what we put out into the world, but we seldom get praise for what we make, what we actually make. So these are 10 essays and 10 things about that I felt all our games have in common. There's 10 reflections, 10 topics on making games. Let's begin. So let's look for a moment at this very sly verb, make. This is a video of us in our old office, circa 10, 2007 or something. Um, yeah, we sat facing each other. We are making something, probably the path. To all outward appearances, we're simply staring into glowing boxes. But since we are making digital things, this is what it takes, sitting and making, not moving. But what is moving on the screen, right? If you, if you rotate, game developer around, you expose a hidden side. What inspires when it's just you and your headphones? I sit with my headphones most of the time. It's just you, your headphones, and your glitches. So what do you notice? Where are you? Yeah, like I said, I wanted to talk about other people's games, but I, then I thought there was just so much of this in the last 10 years of my life. 10 years spent living inside these kinds of spaces, sparse and living and luring me into a place, a place where I'm thinking and doing and making, but where am I? I'm, I'm there, I'm here, I'm in the code, I'm in the zeros and ones, and I can't help but see the patterns to all the things that we're making. So with those realities in mind, and with no, now that you know where we were and what our artistic goals were, so to speak, our first question, of course, had to be, how do we make a video game that's not a game? Some of you may remember this, us saying such things as this. No combat, no rules, no goals, no scores, no addiction, no chat. No addiction because we had this, from the start, this sort of uh, philosophical ideal that a video game should be something that enhances life and doesn't replace it. No chat, because at the time MMOs were really big and we noticed so much of people being not in character and trolling each other and just causing a lot of pain and grief. And we, I should just tell you that like, this was our first game. This is a game called Eight, and I mean, we were gonna make, in 2002, a game starring a little black girl in the Palace of Sleeping Beauty. And it was in full-on 3D, navigable world, and then we take it to adventure game publishers, and they're like, oh, but it's not point and click, oh, but this, you know, oh, there's no combat in it, uh, you know, and I mean, we must have been crazy. No, but anyway, it's, it's just, this was our game. And, and it was roundly, impossible, completely impossible, and we were, we were sort of rejected. So we, we said, all right. Our next game was like a big fuck you to all that. Because we said, I know what we'll do. We'll make a game where everyone plays a deer in a virtual forest, and the main activity is running and sleeping and rubbing against trees. And, and everyone will play it. No, we actually didn't know that anyone would play it. It was kind of a... Um, uh, it, was, it was another opportunity made possible by a museum, um, the MUDAM, Modern Art Museum in Luxembourg, commissioned it. 
originally. And as you can see, we got we had this real principle. I mean, the eight was the same. There was no no words in it, and we just didn't want people to have to talk to one another in order to communicate. Um, so we came up with this system with icons and allowed people to communicate in that way. Another way that we got the knots um, was in the path where we have this whole thing about you go to grandmother's house and stay on the path, but if you do that, you fail. So there's one rule and you have to break it. And there's one goal, which is you know to actually succeed in meeting your wolf, and when you attain it, you die. But the biggest game ex that expressed everything like this, the graveyard, we, we, we had to make because we needed um, something that we felt could be a pure, the purest expression. What could be the purest expression of video game for us? And, and it was before, we, we sort of were making the path and then we stopped making the path for a little while and we made the graveyard in like two months or something. And um, it was just the, the, we said, how much can you strip away? and still have something that people will accept. And we had no idea that anyone would accept it at all, but it, people did. And, and that taught us a lot of things. Um, but it made us more confident than ever to release the path with its sort of play on um, video game rules. And, um, and then there was, at that point that we released the path, we got a lot of heat for it. And uh, I mean, in the sense of the internet sense, um, of heat, and um, so we people were always like, "Oh, it's not a game! It's not a game!" Uh. So we we're like, "All right, it's not a game then." And we start a whole org around this. We we're just like, "Okay, it's not a game," um, because they are acting like we were taking something from them, and like we were some sort of threat, you know, and some evil threat that's going to take their Counter Strike away or whatever, you know. And we're just like, "Okay, guys." You know, but what we were really trying to do was to form some sort of sanctuary for developers. Um, for, it was forums, and I mean, it's still around. Um, but what I think that all those people didn't realize we were trying to add something um, and not take it away. We weren't even saying that this was some sort of category or that you should call your thing a not game or something. It wasn't about that. It was about creating new audiences. It was about finding new developers to make to find those new audiences. It was about the feminine. It was about new forms of interaction. It was about unusual themes and encouraging people to find them and to make games around them. It was about supporting people to find it and, and create their own independent economies. It's about a radical rethinking of what a video game is or can be. It was about authorship. It's about creating artistic experiences if you're so inclined to do so and not feel like you're gonna be attacked and like sent hate mail forever um, for doing it. And um, I mean, I think that one of the things that, um, I mean, I just want to point out that aspect of the feminine. I mean, it's not because I'm a woman that all my games have women in them. It's just that those are the types of things that Michael and I um, found um, the most compelling in terms of, of, you know, like fairy tales and things like this that, that often have women in them. It's, it's like there was just reasons for this that have sort of made our games into these sort of feminine um, there's a lot of femininity into it, and, and it's, it's very sad. I'm just saying this as an aside. This has nothing to do with what I wrote down for my talk, but it's very, it makes me sad to think that that's part of the reason that we haven't been more successful, in a way. I mean, it's like because our games are viewed as feminine. It's just something to think about, um, and it's something that has upset me for a long time, but all right. I'm going to move on to the next topic, which is numbers. Um, Michael and I have, um, over the years, done two... I, don't know, I hesitate to call the second one a manifesto, but the first one definitely was the Real Time Art Manifesto, which we wrote in 2006. It was a call to action. This is before Not Games. We tried this first, um, coming up with 10 points of, of sort of um, things that we felt would make video games better. I mean, we were always, no matter how like nutty things we said sound, um, we were always, oh, bad sync, what's going on? Um, we were always trying to make games better. Someone? <laughs> Mysterious. Oh, it's going so well. I'm, um, I'm going to turn it off and on again. <laughs> That'll do it. Believe. Yeah. I believe. Click your, clap your hands if you believe. No. 
That's that's all I had. That's right there. It is there. It is there. It is okay. Sorry about that, guys. I don't know what causes that. I'm like not being very create rough with this material. Um. Anyway, where was I? All right, and I was reading a book by my favorite poet. You all have a favorite poet, right? Good. You really ought to. My favorite contemporary poet is a woman named Anne Carson. And she wrote a book that she called or subtitled a fictional essay in 29 tangos, whatever. I love that so much. That's kind of why I called my talk, ten incant uh, talk in 10 incantations. But anyway, um, she was once asked why she numbered paragraphs in her prose poem. And she says, oh, it makes me feel more like Wittgenstein. And I think that's part of our problem, too. I mean, we just uh, always are numbering things. Um, in this case, numbering them wrong. I love this slide. I'll never change it. Um, <laughs> And this is all from the Beautiful Art Program. I hope you'll actually look that up because that's, it sort of was the antidote to that that we did a long time ago. We did wrote the Beautiful Art Program last year as a way of guiding our, our, our hearts and minds, I guess, um, into the next 10 years of uh, Tale of Tales uh, existence. Um, these are the points that were there. But I mean, yeah, we do numbers a lot, though. I just wanted to point that out because we do numbers a lot. I mean, um, like I said, our first game was called Eight. Um, and why do we name a game a number? It was because um, primarily because we didn't want um, we didn't want language to enter into it. It was again that issue with language, um, and we figured eight. It's a number in every language. It's almost always the same, yeah. And except for it, when you speak it out, it's in whatever language you choose to speak it in. And we kind of liked that. So then the next game was supposed to be called 144 for re historical reasons lost to the mists of time. We were like, okay, first game's eight, second game's 144, don't ask. But that's the, that's the game that became the path. Um, we changed the name wisely <laughs> at a certain point, although I must admit I fought and fought like crazy to keep it 144. Um, but th since the name 144 came before the design of the game, we were like, how many Red Riding Hoods do we have? We have 144 Red Riding Hoods. <laughs> it's just like, no. You know, so we started dividing 140. The reason there's six is because we started dividing that number and we um, by different other numbers and until we came down with six, we thought that was like the perfect um, thing. Numbers and like in in uh, our game Vanitas, um, the three objects here. We we have three objects there that you you open and close the box, and we figured two is not enough. Two, if you get two of the same item, that's luck. But if you get three, it's fate. Um, and then in Luxury Superbia, which I'll talk a lot more about later, um, there's twelve. But um, other numbers um, that are important to us included um, things like um, time and age. Um, this is a video that we made during the exhibition where we launched Vanitas, actually. Um, where, and um, time is something we're often quite perplexed or, like, I don't know, obsessed by. Ophelia was a, it's part of that experiments and prototypes thing I talked about earlier. Um, we never released it, really, um, until now. Uh, it was actually a clock. Um, a natural clock kind of that we made a long time ago, like right after we made um, the endless forest, actually. And once every hour, this woman floats to the top. It's that so you know it's the hour, and she stays afloat however many um, minutes the hours are. The, if you can count the fishes, that's how many minutes that that are past the hour. If you uh, if there's a duck that comes by and however many times he bobs his head, that's like you know how many hours it is. Fireflies at night, etc. The endless forest, you start life as a young fawn, and then you have to play that for two months before you um, grow up. And as I was saying in the, in the path, the girls are different ages, um, ranging from nine to 19. And um, this also was significant, being able to skip years and having it being odd numbered years. Um, and finally, the, the, the graveyard itself, um, we were intrigued to make people put, in embody people into an avatar that was um, elderly, um, sort of the character based on um, Michael's grandmother who is alive at the time, and that was a really interesting project to do for that reason. Um, and last, the way we can talk about numbers, of course, is we can talk about how much money we made and how much, how did we fund things, and th but that's not this talk, okay? They made us give that talk at uh, GDC Europe because they thought that the, that the developers wouldn't be interested in anything except for like all practical advice about how to get money and stuff. Um, but I just want to say about that, that money is a means to an end. And yes, it's important, but it's not the end of, in and of itself. 
so autonomy. Um, people often bitch about our control schemes and whatnot. Um, and we, we, from the beginning, I've always thought that control and autonomy are things that should um, enhance the game itself. It should be a part of it. It's like, you know, you and your wazd and your mouse look. It's like, you know, this is like a dead, this is a dead way of control, this direct one-to-one -one control. To me, that's dead. To, to me, we came up with this idea in the path, let go to interact, because um, the girl is not you all the time or you might think she's you, or maybe you re identify with her, but ultimately, if you want her to do anything, you're gonna have to let go. To us, that was expressive of what the, 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 the spirit of the fairy tale was, and so we designed our interaction scheme around that. With Vanitas, again, you know, you open the box, you close the box, you open the box, you close the box. It's different every time, um, but if you get three objects, you get a gold star and you're invited to consider how lucky you are. <laughs> and then in our recent game, Bientôt l'été, it's all about these chance meetings, the, the chance of you walking along a, a seashore and you're gathering your thoughts, gathering sentences, and then you're invited to go into a cafe and meet a random person by chance in a cafe, and by chance you both speak French and you play a game of chess with your words and your thoughts and you try to express your love for each other in this limited means. My favorite topic, actually, although it's complicated. I mean, I was saying earlier, talking about what I do all the time and like most of what I do is like design and, and build um, characters, environments, etc. And you know, we've all had this happen if you make 3D models. You're doing working along and something completely messes up. But you're like, wow, that's great. Like, you know, like that's really cool. That's beautiful. But but at the you know, the thing that I've that I really feel is that beauty has a speed. It can be fast like a rocket or an arrow to the heart or slow like honey and take time to absorb. And you look at something like this, I mean, I've kept this image for so long just because it's been, I was like, that is the coolest thing, glitch ever. The beauty of real time though, and how um, it, it just applies to more than making video games. There's a beauty that you find in bettering yourself in practicing something and in making mistakes and then getting better at it. Um, another way that I talk about beauty all the time is when I'm talking about 3D aesthetics. It's like, I, when we were making Vanitas, this is all about Vanitas, we're looking at source images that look like that painting up in the corner, these beautiful, lush, uh, you know, still lives. But then you're making your 3D model and the way that you have a 2D surface in that is your texture maps. I mean, these are my texture maps. It's like the ugliest you know, things in the world. But in the end, you wrap them around the 3D object and you get something that's beautiful, that, 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 that expresses what I wanted to express in that case. And, um, and I think that that's like a wonderful paradox within 3D aesthetics um, in general. And that, I, that makes me love 3D, making things in 3D. Um, but I, at a one point, um, I don't know, it was quite a long time ago actually, probably around the, the beginning of Tale of Tales, I was asked to give a talk at a conference that was called um, Beauty in the Age of uh, Digital Art or something. Um, and the talk went a little bit like this, I'm just gonna say it. Somewhere in the modern era, a definition of beauty was lost, especially in new media art. Artists associate beauty with the creation of simple visual prettiness, as if aesthetics are somehow something shallow, which should not be part of the equation when designing technological systems. In the meantime, offline art has become simplified to commodity, decoration, and private possession, while audiences are left to the mercy of poorly designed pop culture. My standpoint is that beauty is a language that communicates across cultures and should be shared with the masses. In my small case, it's shared with no network communities. I looked into the past eras for a lost history of beauty, one which is deeper than the surface of what one can see. As a creator of 3D interactive environments, I feel there's an opportunity to connect to artistic traditions of storytelling and craft through design. In virtual environments filled with nonverbal and multisensory narratives, design is about architecting the experience of interaction for the audience. This requires considering the aesthetic illusion. It is most important to ensure that the confrontation between audience and virtual world communicates the intended message, but also allows imaginations to run wild. Beauty 
uh, of the totality of the world that an interactor experiences. Concentrating on the big world and not just the individual little elements of it and not stopping at the pretty picture is essential to achieving these goals. What new media art doesn't consider enough of are the bodies of those who experience it. And these are the slides I showed in that occasion. Um, and this, this slide is, a, is um, a diagram of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. And it's showing the arms of the, the cathedral, of the, the processional way, the big courtyard, you know, designed by, by Bernini, and how it feels like something reaching out to you, how your body fits into the design of that cathedral and makes you feel like um, that elevates, something that elevates you just by being there. I talked about this piece by Olafur Eliasson um, that was at the Tate Modern in um, England at the time, and it was called The Weather Project, and it was basically a big artificial sun. But people went there, and it, they laid on the floor. They, they almost were like in this ecstasy of worshiping this, this sun because it reminded them of the real sun, not that it was the real sun. And it was just beautiful. It was a moment that, um, that he was able to create in an artificial environment. I talked about touch and flow, um, another sculpture by Bernini, um, and how interaction is about this flowing uh, through a person's body and when they interact with a system. And ultimately, I talked about our work, and how, which the only game we had at the time was The Endless Forest, and how the, we, all of those principles combined were something that we wanted people to feel while they're laughing in the forest. That it was about that joy that you feel when you're somewhere and, you're, and you're, you feel bigger because you're there, um, even though you're just a little deer standing on a hillside. Um, the Endless Forest had this uh, sort of notion that you were falling asleep. Um, or you, I, it was started out that the Endless Forest in the beginning, in 2005, um, the Endless Forest was primarily a screensaver. And so your computer would fall asleep and you would wake up as a deer in this uh, environment, you would be sleeping. So you'd see all these little sleeping deer as you if you wandered the forest, you'd see sleeping deer and that's people who left their computers on and they're sleeping in the forest. And um, so sleep and silence was something that we designed a lot around a lot. Um, and this is eight again, um, our unfinished game. And, and the whole soundscape of that prototype uh, was just the sound of people sleeping and the sound of magic, really. Um, and then more recently, our game Fatal, um, which has a, a real soundscape. I mean, we've worked a lot with, with, with a lot of really talented um, sound designers and um, musicians, um, but I've always felt that, um, a game, that what Fatal does best is, is its whispers and its, uh, its silences. And we recently updated the game to include, um, let's see if it... Yeah, like words that slide across to try and help people to hear those whispers. Um, but I, I really love the original design of it where you really had to, it was just you and, and sort of trying to catch phrases um, as they uh, were whispered very silently. Um, all right, this is a side note. In December, I spent a whole month drawing in the Louvre Museum in Paris, France. Um, I had a teach. I was taking a workshop, a drawing workshop, a month-long workshop. But every day, I went to the Louvre and I and I sat in front of some of the most wonderful works of art, and I drew, and I was learning to draw, and it was my practice. Um, but there was an incredible silence there that I not not around me because the, the, the Louvre is a, is, a, is a freaking zoo. I mean, there's just so many tourists. But there was a silence that I found within myself by getting away from the computer and doing this thing. Um, so to me, silence um, is, um, it was sort of like I lived outside of language, outside of being understood and had no voice, and then I realized that there was a language that expressed what I felt and that my questions did have answers. Um, that, and I felt like, this related to games so heavily. I mean, these are my photos of things that I was looking at, and it's like, you must speak and you must do something, and that you, you must take care of your soul. And this, um, 
somehow relates to games. It's like I'm always in this process of trying to put all the pieces of me together, actually. I mean, there's a lot of things, like I say, art is traditional, classical art is like my my main love, and, and so I'm always trying to put it together. Um, but one thing I've learned over the years is that I can't help but make things out of my experience. And so if you're gonna make things out of your experience, you have to make sure you have something to say and you have to make sure that you are filled with something. And I guess I'm just filled with drawings. <laughs> and I, it's, I do model drawing, etc. I do all these crazy sketchbooks. Um, and these are the things that, that keep me alive um, and that make me feel like I have something to say. So I just wanted to throw that in there because I think that a lot of game developers think you just need to be filled with games or something. It's like, but you can take every part of your life and bring that to your games, and I think that's extremely important. Endlessness. Okay, this is a big topic for us because you know we have that whole endless forest thing, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, this is a painting by John Collier, and it's called uh, um, Clytemnestra After the Death of Agamemnon. Um, and you know that's the Agamemnon's the big uh, head honcho of the whole thing, the war of Tro the Trojan War, and Clytemnestra was his wife. He came back from the Trojan War, fighting for ten years, lives through that, lives through the wrath of Achilles for goodness sake. Gets back home and she kills him. <laughs> this is these are two images of uh, Salome, which our game the the Fatal is based upon. Um, the one is by Titian, the other by Lucas Cranach. And um, I guess I got fascinated when we were designing Fatal, or the whole genesis of the idea of Fatal was my fascination with this uh, idea of, of a teen Salome was a teenage girl, and she one night dances for her king, King Herod, and he says, you can have anything you want in the whole world, onto the la all of my kingdom. You know, and she says, I want the head of John the Baptist. I mean, come on. St. John the Baptist who baptized Christ, whatever. Anyway, it's just like, to me, this was fascinating. And, but it's like, so this to me was, uh, the, the, the reason why I'm, trying, I'm saying this is that we, we use myths and fairy tales and are fascinated by them like so many people, so many artists throughout all of time, and that this idea of telling and retelling something um, is a principle that we definitely um, take to heart. And, but also there's another thing, like my mom is a singer, she sings jazz. And um, so to me, when I think of endlessness, um, outside of games, I guess, or in, it's what informs games, putting all the pieces of me together. I mean, I'm thinking of Ella Fitzgerald singing Gershwin. I'm thinking of Carmen McRae singing Thelonious Monk. I'm thinking of all these songs that are still sung today by, you know, singers, by my mom, by, you know, and, and, and they're the same songs, but they're, everyone interprets them differently. And, and that's sort of the beauty of the art form of being someone who sings jazz, is being able to put your own take on that. Um, so when we take something like Red Riding Hood and we rethink it, I mean, everyone who tells, retells a fairy tale tells it in a way that suits or the way that's appropriate for the time in which they live. So you know, the idea of this, this loop, this endless loop of taking a girl, taking her to the grandmother's house, she gets to her own end. Every time it's the same, but every time it's also different. And whether she's walking along the path or she's walking along a beach, the endlessness is there. The endlessness of the sea, the endlessness of space, the endlessness of a song or a story, the endlessness of that song sung and resung. This is from an unreleased prototype. Um, I call this thing The Lock. Um, it's a game that I hope to make one of these days. Um, but um, what I was really thinking about when I was, when we were designing this thing and putting it together was that I wanted a system that just kept moving and that it was mesmerizing to watch while you were playing the game. So you could just sit back and watch it. Um, even the, the Endless Forest um, had that too. I mean, the, one of our primary sort of things, reasons we wanted the Endless Forest, we wanted a world that lived 24 seven without us having to be there. So this idea of endlessness, yeah.
and while we're on the endless forest, um, there's this whole topic of nature and um, there's nothing in this world that has taught me more about human nature than the endless forest, um, a game which has been online since 2005 and which we never designed any play activities around. These are examples of things that players have made around the game and that we helped put into the game with their um, collaboration um, and games that they came up with like you know to all look the same and dance in a line and all this stuff I mean um, they came they've come up with a whole um, sort of uh, etiquette and way of playing that we never ever could have designed anyway um, and it, Endless Forest was the first chance we had to see people play with our work um, but there was this whole thing of wanting to make this natural world that looked real and unreal at the same time, um, but allowed the players to um, sort of feel like they were there. Living in, in, in Western Europe, or at least in Belgium, one can forget what a forest is like. Um, and, and you can forget that there's things like dirt and under the ground and underneath all the cement. And um, so making a refuge for people, we had one woman write us and she was from Malta and she says, no trees in Malta at all. She's like, I play your game and then suddenly I know what it's like to be in a forest. And, and that was um, something that we felt really good about. I mean, but we were looking at things like this. This is um, Heart of the Andes by an artist named Edwin Church. It's in the Met, you should go see it. It's gorgeous, it's gigantic. Um, and so we wanted to evoke that same kind of world, this sort of idyllic, unreal yet real space. So The Endless Forest is a game about running, um, running through a forest and feeling that and feeling the joy of it. Um, but when I say real and unreal, I mean, for example, you know, this is a Greek statue from like 500 BC or something called the Critian Boy. And, and it's like, it was the moment that it's considered within art historical circles to be the moment when, um, when, when man achieved realism, you know. But they didn't keep making things that looked like this. They went on and they had to go and exaggerate it, you know. And so you end up with the Loakoan uh, group, which is in the Vatican uh, Museum. And it's just a total exaggeration. And, and that's the thing that people like more than realness. They like ex the exaggeration. They like it when things get a little weird. And you know what, on top of that, people actually prefer this. They prefer the Venus of Willendorf. They prefer this exaggerated view, the, the, the thing that you don't expect, the thing that you have to sit there and interpret. And that's what I think we do, we all do in a way, in video games. All right, love. I forget what my next slide is. <laughs> oh, okay, I remember. All right. Um, so we made a game that was based on the novels of Marguerite Duras, a French novelist who's Michael's favorite. And so this was primarily his game. Um, it was based on a book of hers called Moderato Contabile. Um, and it was a love story. but. Duras um, has a funny way with love. I mean, she doesn't, um, it's not full of um, kissing and passion. It's more filled with um, awkward silences. Michael had a dev development blog through the, throughout the year that he made that game. And um, I mean, I just was in charge of aesthetic things. He, he really um, went into it. And his whole dev blog was about his love and sort of hate f of the whole project of making games in general. And we also took a trip to where uh, Marguerite Duras lived and where a lot of her um, novels take place, a place called Trouville-sur-Mer in France. And um, at the end of the project, I took his blog and the photos and I made books out of them. And that was to show my love for him. Um, this is a temple of love, this piece of architecture which only exists uh, in gardens as nothing more than a place for lovers to meet. And we took that same sort of structure and put it into our game, Luxurious Superbia. Talking about Luxurious Superbia now, so get ready. Because um, not only was it based on love, I mean, we wanted to do sort of like Biento Lete was our heavy love game. And then, then we wanted to make a light, love light. Um, we called it the simple sex game as opposed to the complicated love game. And we based it on things like, yeah, sex toys, 
fruits and flowers, vegetables. Uh, we wanted to get this idea of like motion, but at the same time, our usual thing of like, yeah, you got to be elevated, you got to square it, cir square the circle, or circle the square, or whatever, and like, you know, make people feel the cathedral and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> So that's our game about touching, and you have to touch it a lot. <laughs> but I mean, our, to me, our, the ultimate like sort of love game or love thing that we made was ages and ages ago, back when we were still being in Trippie 8 Super. And this is a project called The Kiss. That's a scan, a 3D scan of both of our bodies in the act of kissing. And This project was several explorations of that 3D model, and in this one, you, you sort of use two joysticks. It's like an installation. You have two joysticks that you can control the camera with, and you're floating through our kissing bodies. It's hard to see this one. It's another really old project. Again, it's part of that experiments and prototypes. So Driving from place to place until there is no refuge or no rest. Kill Christians and Jews. asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up. That was from a project that was actually called Numbers, after the biblical book of Numbers. And it was a project that we made um, in 2001, after the Twin Towers thing, and uh, it, it, it brought out a lot of cultural differences between Michael and I, being from different countries, and we so we arted about it, <laughs> um, as we did at the time. However, it marked also the first time that we felt like our work was bigger than ourselves. We'd done a lot of work that was sort of about us, or uh, it was a little too personal or something all the time. Um, and so we wanted suddenly, this was the first project that we made that was we felt like was about the world. However misguided that may have been. But we, um, people tend to think that we don't 
approve of violence or something um, when nothing could be further from the truth. Um, there's actually a lot of violence in our games, um, and it's there for a reason, which I think is the most important part. Um, I think that people use video games as a form of catharsis, a way of understanding this kind of um, these these impulses that we have inside of ourselves, um, a way to understand what's come before us and what may come in the future dealing with that. Um, it might be something that we have underexplored. Or maybe not. But like it or not, this is the world that we live in. And that cultural rift that we were trying to express in numbers, that's not just us, that's all of us. You know, and this is, it can't be glossed over and all the joy and humor in the world might make it a little better, put a balm on it, but it's not gonna go away. Um, these are all pictures that I collected from Twitter. I collect all these pictures of, from various uh, uprisings, revolutions, uh, um, things going on in the world. The world has changed, the Countess said. Um, uh, it's, it's, you can't ignore that. You can't ignore that this is how the world works now, and this is how people communicate with one another, that um, that if you think about an artist um, reflects the civilization that they live in, um, then you can't help in a way but reflect it in your games. Um, I, I sort of put this little line in the in my dis chart talk description about it being the end of history and stuff. I mean, there's there's all kinds of theories about that and big books that I've sort of half read. Um, but the end of history is kind of about this idea, you know, if you think that the history is written by the winners, and now you kind of have to question who are the winners and who are the losers. Huh? I, I can't draw any sort of like uh, like. Um, conclusions like oh morally you know oh, the people doing the uprising are the good guys and the you know the, the mob is you know should democracy you know all that kind of stuff um but one thing i do know the revolution will not be televised the relevant revolution will be live <laughs> and um and i think that all of our games um or that i don't want to say that uh, that 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 with games you can you can help people deal with that that's my main point, or I hope that that's true, um, at least. Um, we're planning on making a game about it, <laughs> about in some way, about. All our, our games are never about, in the strictest sense. We like to keep, uh, allow people to find their own space within our work, I guess, and to draw their own conclusions. I don't believe in propaganda, in other words. Um, and if you're wondering about all the cheesy sunsets I've been using on all my slides, the, the game is sort of codenamed Sunset right now. So that's why the sunsets, because I've got sunsets on the brain. Expect to hear more about this project soon, I guess. But I just want to, I'm sort of at the end of all my topics. Um, there's my brain on Keynote. <laughs> and here's all the things to me which make up video games. And You can kind of take it or leave it. <laughs> I hope that that you'll be inspired or to think about your own games in in all of their depth and breadth, and not just about the the fun things, but about the not so fun things. Um, and I hope that I mean, when I said that not games maybe wasn't necessary anymore, it was sort of at this thought of like you know it was the other day. Um, my friend Robert uh, retweeted a link to like three games based on Franz Kafka's The Trial. And I was like, hey, my work here is done. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> you don't need me, you're, you're walking, you know. Um, so I don't know, it's something that I hope will continue and that will continue, the independent spirit will continue and that um, we'll continue to find ourselves within the things that we make. And that is my talk. I made it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if
if you have any questions, questions, comments, whatever, please ask them now. Yeah. Or want to just talk about something, because I'm, I'm standing here, so. And they told me I can keep going. Is anyone, anything? Yes. Oh my god, I love to use that stuff. But now we're using Unity, which sort of half has that, half, kind of. But if something came along tomorrow that worked the way Quest did, I would use it in a heartbeat, even if it meant like all kinds of porting hell. Because um, that's the only reason to use Unity, is all the places you can compile to. Um, anyone? I would like to make a comment, then, if no one has a question. Um, Someone was telling me, like, oh, they think that this is the first time a black woman has done a keynote speech at a game conference or something, which, to which I would like to say, fucking hell, can that be true? What century is this? Come on, people. Get it together. I'm talking to you, Indie Game Summit. All right. Yes. The lack of developers of color. And I've read some articles, and some of them have had what I feel is like, you know, the explanation for it. Yeah. And some of them really haven't. And some people are trying to dig deeper in this, into the industry and see who actually is, uh, you know, a, a, a black developer, brown developer, so on and so forth, mm -hmm. um, and find that. And, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, minority developers here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and it's great to see that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's great to see that, that we do have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I think it, in places like this, in Indicade um, has been a leader in trying to program um, not only diversity into their talks, but also to talk about something other than money, to talk about more than monetizing your clicks. Um, I mean, I think it's you know important that we remember that there's a lot of things. People spend a lot of time doing this stuff. That's the only thing I was trying to express. You spend a lot of your time making these things, and it, a lot more goes into it than just thinking about your bottom line. Um, so, and I think we all know that. It's just you don't need me to say that. Um, but yeah, um, you I had it first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's say that. Yeah. Well, this comes from a lot from us um, thinking that artists, visual artists, like traditional gallery artists, are really irresponsible because it. Especially nowadays, it seems like gallery art is this little cordoned off thing in art fairs, and it has is so separate from the culture, the wider culture. I mean, I know video games are a niche, but at least we're trying to reach people. We're trying to enrich people's lives with experiences and, and possibly give them tools and things that can help them get through their daily lives. I mean, whereas it feels like art has that power. And uh, like um, Miguel uh, Sicard said in his talk, art is always revolutionary. It's always a bomb that blows up that like wakes people up. But if your art is sitting in a gallery where only like 50 people are ever going to see it, then it's like, what's the point in a way? It, that's always been our feeling. We, we started with using computers to make our artwork and using the internet and then games because it was a way to reach people directly without all the bullshit and without all the middlemen, without a gallery, without having to set up some physical thing. It's like if you have a computer, which is a problem, we know, but at least it's not, at least people sort of accept computers as being something that is in the world and everything. It's not like, oh, I have to go to a gallery, I have to go to a museum, and in fact, I have to fly to that specific city at that specific time. So anyway, we were thinking about it that way, like you make beauty in the world and you don't make art in that sense. And, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you sir, yeah, back there. It's okay. My talk wasn't fully formed either. <laughs> yeah. Aside from uh, endless ports, mm -hmm. how uh, a lot of your games seem to come from a very sort of a, they, they start at a personal place. How do they end in a space that other people can enter and put themselves into in, in your life? 
Right. Well, you know, like the re reviewers, game reviewers always say, this game isn't for everyone. Um, <laughs> but it's more like um, we try to, to relate to people uh, in a way, like through the stories that we base our games on, in a way. Like we choose fairy tales because everyone knows that story. And then so if you're open to the game, if you, if you like it, um, you bring that knowledge to the game and perhaps that fairy tale meant something to you and now you're playing a game where you know that this is not the same tale that you were told or that you remember, but perhaps it makes you think about that in a new way or relate it to your life in a new way or, I don't know, just makes you have fun in some way that you didn't think you were going to have or, you know, um, and it's true, The Endless Forest is the only multiplayer, like, social game, although I would say that Luxurious Superbia is a really fun local multiplayer game. <laughs> Put the tablet on there. I mean, and so it, we try to deal with experiences that everyone has had. I mean, it may start in a personal place, I mean, which I'm not even sure it does all, all the time, but... Um, it's definitely with this idea in mind that it's gonna be something out in the world and a lot of people are gonna interact with it. And so we want to use that time that they're, get allow that they're graciously using to play our game. We wanna use that time wisely um, or, or respectfully of people's time. Um, but yeah, we know that it, it's, um, that, that we haven't found our audience yet sometimes. It's how we feel, you know, also. And I think that's also um, something that we don't have a lot of control over, <laughs> but right now, um, but we're trying. I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but my half of it. Okay. Um, you, please, yes. Both. That I really liked. Oh, well, okay. I liked that threes game when it came out. If you follow my Twitter, you know I was like sitting there. I my score went from like a hundred and something to like seven thousand and something because I was completely addicted to it. And I, like I said, I ha I can't stand addiction of of games because it feels like. W although I think that's an excellent game, I, I will praise it, but at the same time I'll curse it because I and I deleted it. And I del after after two days, I was like, no way, this is not working. I had to prepare my talk here, you know, and I'm playing threes anyway. Um, so there's that. I play a lot of mobile games because I I don't I'm spending a lot of time making stuff and so I don't have a lot of time to play but I, I like things like the room you know the room was a great game that I played recently the room two because I played the first one um, so I, it's nothing unique and nothing special you know um, I've, I played papers please recently and that well you asked games I really really liked I didn't really really like it but I was glad that it was made if you know what I mean you know I mean I, I appreciate where that was coming from absolutely um, I'm going to call out Robin and he's going to get all red in the face, but I love Sound Self. I played that at uh, in IndieCade last time. I think Sound Self is beautiful and it's going to be um, great when that comes out. That game, that iPad game called Dry, it's like a little multiplayer game um, for iPad uh, where you, you have a little character and you work with other people on the uh, miscellaneous people on the internet to like do little puzzles, but they're like almost, it's so clumsy that you just sit, spend all your time laughing. Um, and you have very rudimentary ways of, of communicating with each other. I mean, but the games we're tweeting about, sometimes um, Michael is playing those games um, um, often because I don't play too many of, of like we, we played, or he's playing, um, what is it, Bioshock Infinity. That is more research, actually. Um, but I sit there and I watch him play it. Um, and uh, there, there's reasons for that. It's, not, it's got nothing to do with me liking it or not liking it. It's more that I, I get simulator sickness from first person view cameras all, a lot. Which is which sucks because we're making our next game is going to be first person view. I'm like we're going to have to have alternate a few alternate control schemes going on here to make this work. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much all I've been into lately uh, is mobile things. Um, yeah. Okay, is that it? We done? Oh my god! Oh. All right. <laughs> Thank you.